Okay, we have one more speaker before the break, and then we can do a Q&A during the break. Is that okay? Everybody on? Okay, our next speaker will talk about trees in the cities, which are also a significant problem these days, and we have a significant solution. Bob O'Connor. All right, so um, I'm going to take you from the forest to the trees. So um, I'm actually a government bureaucrat, so um, I talk to a lot of engineers in energy efficiency at our energy department uh, a lot of times. They have forms you have to fill out to, um, to document why energy efficiency, your tool, will work. So what if you had a machine that could reduce heating and cooling costs and peak energy loads? And that machine could also reduce storm water and combine sewer overflows. And that machine could also clean the air and the water. It could double the investments in the local economy. It would be the only totally locally energy efficient tool that exists. It would provide local jobs. It would increase property values. It would it improve public health, sequester carbon, and it would get better over time rather than like gray infrastructure gets it goes downhill over time and has to be replaced what what would you would you want to invest in that machine would that be something that we would spend billions of dollars on or would we say we have something better on the toolbox already so um you already know what the answer is but um all those things a tree can do so um Joan gave a very great talk about forests, but I'm going to talk about individual trees. And I wanted to start out by just taking a, a moment, and I'm going to try to get through these slides quickly so you can catch up a little bit, but to just take one moment to um, think about a tree that you personally have a connection with. Like I have a lot of trees that I have a personal connection with, but there's a couple that are my favorite. So if you just close your eyes for one minute and think of that tree, I don't know if you were around when the tree was planted. The one I'm thinking of, I planted. Um, the first time that you encountered that tree, maybe it's in your neighborhood, in a park, in your yard, if you have a tree in your yard. And then you think about every spring when the flowers come out on that tree, whether they're green flowers or bright flowers, every tree has flowers. And the leaves come out in May and all of a sudden these bright or actually a little bit lighter colored leaves are out there for you to look at and then before you know it it has full leaves on it and then as the spring rains come it catches the rain on the on the leaves and if you go out in a rainstorm in the beginning of the rainstorm you notice under the tree it's not raining the first quarter of an inch is collected by those leaves every time and then as it goes through the hot summer you might sit under that tree or as you're walking along, you might notice how much cooler it is when you walk by that tree under its shade. And then as the, the summer comes to an end, you notice that the, the, the tree is looking a little bit different. You start to see the first color in that tree. The tree I'm thinking of turns a bright red every fall. And then the leaves start to look a little bit duller and finally they fall off and then on the ground you have all these leaves, like an incredible amount of leaves um, coming from one tree. And then over the winter, you, you notice that in the windy uh, days, the tree is moving back and forth in that wind. And you're looking at that tree when there's like a high wind warning or something, is, is my tree gonna be affected by that? And you see the tree swaying back and forth and um, and actually that tree is absorbing some of that wind even without its leaves so as you go through the whole year that tree is providing so much beauty so much value and all these different things that i just mentioned just from that one tree so we uh came up you can open your eyes now if you had them closed um we had the idea um uh, a few of us and with the help of an intern that we had one summer um, to 
tried to launch a tree planting program in the cities of Massachusetts based on energy efficiency because um, trees actually provide a huge benefit uh, for energy. So we've got a lot of quotes from Aldo Leopold, but I, I wanted to put this one up there. Um, there are two things that are of interest to me, the relationship of people to each other and the relationship of people to the land. And the first slide that I showed you of all the technical benefits that a tree can provide is one thing, but the other thought that you had as you thought of that tree was, what can a, what can a tree do to uh, make your life better, personally? And um, so over the last three and a half years, in 13 cities in Massachusetts, um, our, our new program, funded through energy efficiency dollars, has planted 10,000 trees uh, across Massachusetts. And as, as I'll show you in a minute, um, we've specifically picked neighborhoods that had the least trees to focus on. And with each tree planting, we try to connect the people to the tree. In fact, we did one study by mapping where the location where all these trees were, the first thousand trees that we planted in Chelsea. And people said, how can you plant any trees in Chelsea? There's no room for them. And now we're up to about 2,000 trees in Chelsea that have been planted. And these are like six or eight foot trees. These are not seedlings. Um, when you map the, the um, census data on top of the tree data, and then we said, well, draw a circle of 50 feet around every tree. That's the size of the canopy when it grows up in 20 or 30 years. How many people actually live within those circles? And in Chelsea, there were 5,000 people that lived within 50 feet of those 1,000 trees. So that just shows you the connection that people have with these trees. And we actually asked them to water the trees for the first two summers, so they have a, a real connection to the trees that are being planted in their yards. But the, the interesting thing about our program was, um, in the beginning, people said, you know, we have like a lot of modeling studies that show the benefits of trees that I, that I rattled off in the beginning. And people that I work for said, we need concrete proof that trees actually save energy. Models are one thing, but we can't really take money from our fund that we're buying new light bulbs and putting in insulation um, to plant trees. That's a little bit too touchy-feely for government. So at the same time that this, we were thinking of this, the Asian longhorn beetle disaster was, was happening, was unfolding in Worcester. Um, and it had been in Worcester for many years before they found the first bug. And so it was very, very widespread, and it's a huge threat to the northern uh, hardwood forest. So the solution in, in a neighborhood where 700 homes were was to cut down every tree that could be a host for the Asian longhorn beetle. And that's about 95% of the trees. Just a few conifer species are not uh, susceptible. So this is um, a street in Worcester. Um, and we didn't have a picture with the trees on. This is the, the winter that they were going to cut down all the trees in 2009 and 2010. This street had a canopy that covered the street. It was like a tunnel as you look down in it. And this is the, after, the picture afterwards where they cut down 95% of the trees. We made a commitment to replant those trees, and this is four years later, the same street. Uh, and you can see it's really starting to look better. We had stories from people who said, after they cut down the trees, I couldn't find my house because the trees were like the gateway to your neighborhood. They were what you recognized in your neighborhood, and people could not find their house. So they tried a lot of different methods to replant the trees in Worcester. First, they hired companies with big, heavy equipment and came in with bobcats to plant the trees. It cost a lot, didn't use a lot of people, and people weren't happy with it. Nobody really wanted a heavy equipment driving around their yard. So then they came up with a new method, which was planting all the trees, as large of a tree as we could plant by hand. And uh, these were about six or eight foot containerized trees and hiring unemployed local people, training them up on how to plant trees, and then just having these crews go door to door and plant trees. So we learned from that experience to launch our program in, um, across the state. 
And one other study that we used, which was actual measuring energy in trees, was a study from Hutchinson, Minnesota, which is out on the plains, a small city, a windy area. And a, a PhD student had measured all the tree cover in the city. So what was the canopy cover 500 feet from your house, 1,000 feet from your house? And then they got the energy data from every single house, and they kind of made it apples to apples by you know, figuring out the square footage, how much insulation they had, uh, all that kind of stuff. And they came up with the same results that we found in Worcester. So those pictures where I showed you the full canopy of 40% canopy cover in the city to 5% after they cut the trees, we actually had a, a master's student at UMass do a study of all the electricity used in that neighborhood in Worcester and in one summer, and they balanced the two summers out with a degree day, so they were like similar, the electricity use went up 40% in one summer, from one summer to the next because of the loss of the trees. And the researcher in Hutchinson, Minnesota found the same thing. It's basically about, for each 1% of canopy in your neighborhood, you're gonna save about 1% in the summer cooling costs and about 1% in the winter costs. Even though the trees don't have leaves, they divert the wind enough to save you energy. So armed with those uh, statistics, we went to the drawing board to try to figure out how could we do this? How could we increase the canopy cover in neighborhoods with low tree canopies in a significant way? And we came up with a goal of about five to 10% increase in 30 years when the trees grew up. And actually, that is the, a simple way to figure that out is it's about five to 10 trees per acre. So in a city, you don't you think of blocks, but we were thinking in acres. So here's a three acre block in a typical um, Massachusetts, uh, we work in what we call the gateway cities. There's 26 um, cities in Massachusetts that are mostly old mill cities that are um, not doing well economically um, and we are focusing on helping those cities. So this is a typical gateway city, and uh, we actually have the circles of how the trees would grow over 10, 20, and 30 years. And we've actually figured that even within eight or 10 years, we could save 1% of the energy, which is a huge amount. The other thing that's unique about trees is not only are they the only local, totally local en energy efficiency tool, we're not getting the solar panels from some far-flung place, we're growing the trees in a local nursery. We're hiring local people to plant the trees. We're working with local nonprofits to partner with us to do the outreach and education. Uh, and we're committing local people to water the trees. It's totally a local initiative. And, um, but the other interesting thing about tree planting is that in a city, around that one tree that you're planting, within a very short distance, there's lots of households. So the energy benefits of that one tree might go to five or 10 households as that tree grows and becomes more mature. The other thing I wanted to point out was that if you see, this is the location of the 26 gateway cities. There's a lot of cities that are close to each other. So Chicopee, Holyoke, Springfield, uh, Peabody, Salem, Lynn, um, Brockton and uh, Taunton, Fall River, New Bedford. So we came up with this, um, this is all not rocket science, but um, as we start planting in a city, the trees are free. And we basically use a, we work with a nonprofit in each city that's a local neighborhood-based nonprofit. First thing we do is we pick about 500 acres of the neighborhood that has the lowest canopy cover, and it's usually also uh, a neighborhood that has a lot of poverty. So we get the word out, we start planting trees, and then in the second year, we're kind of in full um, um, program mode. We're planting 50 trees a week during the two, uh, the summer, the spring and the fall planting season. And then by the time we get to year three or four, everybody's been asked, do you want a tree? Do you want a tree? Some people don't want a tree. We're finding that out. But that's actually the biggest challenge we have is how to convince people that they want a tree. So as we start winding down, we take that crew and we move to the next city. So we're creating the second half of this rectangle by working in the next city and continuing to work in two cities so we can be efficient. So um, this is a, a sample of some mapping that was done in Lawrence, which is one of our, our planting cities. We're working with um, Groundwork Lawrence is actually running the program in that city. 
And uh, the first graph is the, the canopy cover. So the darker the area is the more the canopy cover. The, the next uh, slide is the, um, what is the next slide? The purple is the, the renter occupied. So this is another challenge that we have in this program is that the area without the trees is the area that has the renters. So then there's a, 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 a canopy cover per capita. And so we're basically picking the areas that are renter occupied with no trees. And if you have like an income per capita income, it would show the same thing. So we're focusing on two neighborhoods in Lawrence. And we're doing that same method in each of these cities. We're working with the local government. We actually select in each city a nonprofit that we work with that knows the neighborhood and maybe they're not into planting trees. Actually, there's only one city that had a nonprofit that was like the tree planting uh, nonprofit. In Fall River, the tree planting committee had been planting trees. Every other city we're working in, we're finding a, sometimes an urban gardening uh, organization. Sometimes it's just a human services organization that we talk to and they're interested in doing this. In, in New Bedford, uh, there's a nonprofit that helps the neighborhood in all kinds of ways. When we went down to talk to them, they were doing uh, tax returns for the, the near people in the neighborhood. And immediately they said, well, next year we'll be doing the tax returns and we'll be like passing out information about a tree. So here's how you can save money. Uh, eventually you could save a couple hundred dollars a year um, on your energy bills if you had more trees in your area. So we're picking the um, older neighborhoods with older houses, uh, 80, 81 percent of the homes in these neighborhoods are built before 1980, which means they have little or no insulation. Um, we're picking areas with dense residential areas, a lot of households per acre, low existing canopy cover, only 10 to 20 percent now, uh, high poverty rates, on the average two times the uh, statewide average. Um, we have maps of areas that we call environmental justice neighborhoods that have uh, higher poverty, uh, higher minority populations, and higher non-English speaking populations. And we're focusing on those areas as well. And, and cities that have uh, low resources. So they're not planting trees on their own. So as it turns out, even in any of these cities where when you walk down the triple deckers and the pavement, uh, looks like where could we plant a tree? There, there are places to plant a tree. And I would argue that in each one of these neighborhoods and cities, you could double the canopy cover from 10 to 20 percent to 30 to 40 percent. It can be done. So if you look at the canopy cover of West Roxbury, it's about 40 percent of Roxbury, which is right next door. It's about half that. So the area in the small yards is actually the the prime area to plant trees. Even if it doesn't look like there's a yard in the front, maybe there's cars being parked in the, in the area that's in front of the house. The side yard behind the house, there's always room to plant trees in these neighborhoods, yes. What does the UPC stand It means urban tree canopy. So this is Lawrence, which has about 26%. Um, and remember that map I showed you, the outside of Lawrence has probably higher than 26%, but the downtown core area has below but on the average it's about 26 percent. And then the possible areas is almost another 26 percent and then there's impervious areas which we're interested in digging up the pavement to plant trees but it is a lot more expensive. So at this point we're planting trees in yards. About 80 percent of what we try to do is we talk to the renter, we get the permission from the landlord to plant the tree, we come out with our crews who are hired locally and we plant the trees in the yard. If we can plant two or three trees, more the better. Once you get someone interested, if there's room for that tree to grow up and survive, that's what we're trying to do. So um, imagine if you doubled the canopy in all of our cities in Massachusetts or in this, in this country. We actually have about 26% on the average for the major metropolitan areas in, in the whole USA. Um, what if we increase that to 40 or 50 percent? Think of all of the, each 1 percent would save 1 percent of the heating and cooling costs. And, and around here, heating is like king. We use much more energy for heating than cooling. But in Sacramento, where they've had, they've planted 2 million trees. The, the electric utility has planted 2 million trees because they're trying to save on cooling costs. Imagine all the energy would save, but beyond the 
the energy. Imagine the stormwater benefits. Imagine uh, the, um, the, the amount of cooling you would have. In Massachusetts, we're estimating that the number of de days where it's over 90 uh, degrees will change from 11 currently to uh, 90 um, in 2070. So imagine what it's going to be like to live in a neighborhood with 10% canopy cover when it's 90 days of 90 degrees over the, over the summer. And then imagine the future where the, there's 40% or 50% canopy cover in the neighborhood. Uh, it's not going to, you know, I'm, I'm not here to try to figure out how to stop climate change. I'm just into the, the um, uh, adaptation and improving to outbalance what's, what's happening. So I'm just going to quickly show you uh, in Brockton, we're working with a land trust, the um, Wildlands Trust, to uh, help do the outreach. And as we're finding out in cities that we've been planting for three years, I've never had a program in state government where money was not the, um, the, the limiting factor. We, we actually have huge support from, uh, from the governor on down. Governor uh, Baker last um, week planted the 10,000th tree on Lynn Common. And he was saying we need to plant 100,000 more trees. So he is like gung ho to plant as many trees as we can. What we're finding is a limiting factor is finding people who want a tree. We can find like a lot of people to begin with. We can plant 2,000 trees in a, in a neighborhood uh, in, a, in a year or two. But then the orders start coming down. So we're really working on marketing and education on how we can improve um, people to want a tree. We're doing a phone survey right now with a, a Brandeis intern. Well, first he's calling all the people who'd gotten a tree across the state and then he's going to call in the same neighborhoods people that didn't get a tree. Did they not hear about it? Um, and we're finding that most of the people that got a tree, you know, we, we leaflet every door. We leave a sticky uh, note that says, do you want a free tree? And it's in every language that is being spoken in the neighborhood. And um, the phone survey, and he's gotten like 15% of the people to answer the phone, which I think is pretty incredible, or call him back. Actually, he'll leave a message and they'll call him back to say, yes, I got a tree and I'm 95% are extremely happy about the program. And you could say, well, 5% are disgruntled. The other 5% are somewhat happy. So, you know, m maybe their tree wasn't healthy or, you know, we try to um, have them call us to replace the tree. So. Um, just going to take you on a quick tour. We're just starting in Lynn, which is uh, groundwork. Somerville actually is doing a lot of work in Lynn. There are partners there. In Fall River, we've been planting for three years. The Fall River Tree Committee was our partner down there. We also have a stormwater model going down in uh, Fall River where the, uh, the, the gray infrastructure that they've invested in isn't totally solving the stormwater problem. So we're, we're planting what we call tree filters in one neighborhood where these, the, the, the pavement drains to this area where the tree is growing and the tree keeps kind of like sacrificing itself for our benefit. But it's, it's continuing to dry out the soil and grow and um, reduce the stormwater flows. In Quincy, we're, um, we're planting in one of the largest um, public housing authority areas uh, called Germantown out on the, the peninsula of Quincy. We're planting 800 trees. Uh, this fall, we're planting 200 trees in Quincy. This um, photo over on the left here is a, uh, we had two public meetings in the, in the neighborhood at the community center, and we actually had maps of the, of the, the housing um, neighborhood and uh, a choice of trees. And people came, we had uh, dinner, and they, with their families, they went around and picked the trees that they wanted near their house. So this is like one of the, and um, we're, we're um, out there this fall and next spring we'll be planting the rest of them. In Holyoke, we're working with Nuestras Reyes, which is a local community group that does um, farming for immigrant um, residents out on, along the Connecticut River. And uh, they wanted to create their own tree nursery. And this is a picture of the tree nursery. They have 300 trees that they're raising from seedlings so that after we leave the uh, city, They'll continue to plant more trees from the, um, the $1 trees that they're planting to begin with turn into $140 trees in three years when they're, when they're grown up. And it's taken care of by a uh, retired, couple of retired people in the city that take care of the nursery. 
Chicopee next door. We've moved from Holyoke to Chicopee, and we're um, this is a, actually a vacant lot that um, one of the neighbors owns, and he's hoping to uh, build a house on the lot. So we're planting the trees in in kind of visioning where the house will be. Most of the of the people who got a tree, we're finding from our phone surveys, found out from their neighbors. So it's word of mouth and seeing the crew out there that actually, for all the work that we're doing on outreach at um, church gatherings and, and fairs and all kinds of different events. So as you remember that, that, that chart where the, had the UTC that um, met uh, urban tree canopy, there's a huge swath in all these cities where we could plant trees on paved areas, and that would have like a huge stormwater benefit, um, and it would have a much bigger impact on the um, urban heat island as well. But it costs a lot of money to find places like this to plant, but that's in our in our um, in our sites as well. So. Um, Planting trees over pavement will save about eight to 10% um, of, the, of the water flow um, over the season. Yeah, I'm done. So here's the uh, map of the thousand trees. And these are just some of the quotes from the people that they've talked to on the phone. There was one person that uh, said, I just came back from photographing my neighbor's trees when you called. So um, the neighborhood is like talking to each other about their trees. Um, people are saying they look forward to coming home because they want to see how their tree is doing. Um, they're just like really psyched up about the trees. So that part of the program is actually more exciting to me than the, than the um, energy savings, but that's how we get the money to do this. So I think um, there's a lot of, a few ideas I had there about um, expanding tree nurseries, um, trying to get more density into the neighborhoods, um, figuring out the outreach capacity so more people will want trees, um, figuring out ways to um, reduce the heat island by planting on pavement, and then um, setting up more programs uh, once we show that we're saving energy. So that's it.